Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for uh, your Shabbat. We thank you for your Moedim, your appointed days. We thank you for this uh, Rosh Hashanah, this new year, this opportunity for us to uh, refocus our hearts and our minds on you, uh, for us to refocus and recalibrate our discipleship, putting uh, 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 our walk in righteousness with you at the foremost, and our heart for repentance and restoration with you and others at the forefront of our discipleship practices day in and day out. Lord, I pray that as we dig into your word today, that you will speak boldly into our hearts and our lives, that you, uh, your words will be spoken, be the only thing heard, that nothing of me will be involved except that which you have ordained specifically for this purpose. And Lord, I ask that you prepare our hearts now for everything you have in store. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. So, Shana Tova, once again, to our Mishpocha, and uh, it's always exciting and awesome to be able to gather together uh, on Rosh Hashanah, and hopefully you're able most years to join us for both services, but either way, the, the evening service, the morning service, or both if you're able to, to be able to get together and as Mishpocha, as family, together in community to hear the sound of the shofar. As you heard at the beginning of our service, during the Torah service, you'll hear again in just a little bit when we do the calls of the shofar, the sound of the shofar is amazing. It is awe-inspiring. It is literally soul-gripping. As we hear the sound of the shofar today, may it be a beacon of hope uh, of what awaits us with Messiah's return and a calling to Teshuvah to return to repentance that our hearts may be ready whenever that day and hour which no man knows does in fact arrive. So a few years back, Danielle and I uh, decided to buy a new car for her. Uh, she had a minivan that was, uh, I don't know if you've ever had the fun of transmission starting to act up. Um, we have, and it's not as fun as I just said. Um, and uh, so we had a, a minivan that the, the transmission was starting to get a little squirrely. And, you know, when you drive used cars, which is pretty much all we've ever done our entire driving life, when you drive used cars, you know it's just a matter of when the next thing is going to happen, right? And that vehicle had kind of gotten to a point where it was nickel and diming us, and uh, we decided that we needed to buy a new vehicle. This was before uh, new car prices skyrocketed two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was. Um, and so we decided we wanted to buy a new car. Uh, I have always liked Toyotas, and in particular, uh, the Toyota Camry is supposed to be one of the safest cars on the market. And so we decided that we were going to buy a Toyota Camry, and it was at the, the, the first year in the new generation that's out right now, and they had all kinds of new features and stuff that were now standard that you used to have to pay extra for. And so we went and we bought this brand new car. Never in our lives we had new car before. Uh, never had either of our parents had new cars that we're aware of. Um, my parents always had, you know, uh, used cars that were, you know, uh, one day past their expiration date all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't grow up, I don't know about you guys, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. And by a lot of money, I mean, I didn't really grow up with money. We, we didn't really see it very often, I didn't think. Um, uh, but my parents didn't really have uh, a lot of money to spend on cars and, uh, and such. And so we decided to buy our our first ever new car. And I don't know that I'll ever do it again um, because it's stressful having to think about the fact for the next five or six years, there's a payment that has to be made every month unless you can pay it off early. Um, but nonetheless, we bought this car. We bought the, 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 the one tier above like factory model, one tier above what taxi drivers use, right? Um, like it's, it's, it's just right there. It's got some of the bells and whistles. It's got some of the nice perks to it, but it was also really cheap and easy to get our hands on. And uh, we actually went there looking for for uh, the year model before it that they had on lot that was used, but they couldn't give us the deal we wanted on the used one, but there were some rebates and stuff on the new one that they were able to do, so it all worked out pretty well. But we finally had our first ever brand new car, and we wanted to baby this thing. We wanted to, to, you know, make it last as long as possible. We, you know, it's one of those things you go and get it. All of a sudden, you're washing your car you know, every couple of days instead of, you know, maybe once every couple of years. Uh, you know, sometimes you're worried with used cars that the dirt's the only thing holding it together. Now you got a new car, and the bolts are a little tighter. And so we were washing it regularly, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so. Uh, couple months, maybe a little longer than that after we had it. Um, most of you see me on Saturdays with my coffee mug, and some of you have seen me all the rest of the week equally with a coffee mug. 
all the time. And so uh, we, were, we were leaving the, the neighborhood to go. I don't even remember where we were going, but we were leaving to go somewhere. And uh, I wanted to get a cup of coffee. And so there was the, the PJ's Coffee in Spanish Fort had just opened up uh, a couple of weeks before this. And so we swung into the drive through to get some coffee real quick. Uh, and uh, as we're leaving, you know, her car uh, is it, really nice, but it sits really low in the car. Like the car is low, but the, the seats are also really low. So the top of the window is above my shoulder when I'm seated in the seat all the way down and comfortable and what have you. So I'm sitting here, we're up at the window, I get my drink, we go to take off. And as we're taking off, I think I've cleared the drive through I can start to turn left to go around the building and go out the direction I wanted to go instead of having to go out the other side of the, the parking lot, which is a little less convenient. And so I go to make this turn uh, uh, to the left around the building and no sooner do I get the wheel turned and start to let off the brake that I all of a sudden hear <laughs> and I'm like great what in the world and so I turn the wheel the other way and I pull off of it and, and get out and I look and so the, they now they've actually put a solve to this but the, the, the sidewalk uh, to the door that the only people that use it are the actual employees bringing out drinks that may take too long, so they push you up ahead of the line. So this door is there. There's a little sidewalk that runs off. The sidewalk is probably a good maybe three quarters of a foot or so high, and the corner goes all the way to the end of the building. And, I mean, it's a really sharp corner uh, uh, right there at the end of the building, and I couldn't see the end of the sidewalk. I saw the lines for the driveway ended, and I thought we had cleared it. So I went to turn, and I ran the side skirt under the driver's side door across that corner of the concrete on Danielle's brand new car, um, all because I needed a cup of coffee. And uh, she was none too happy. I was far less happy. I'm pretty sure there were a few expletives I will not repeat that may have slipped out of my mouth. Uh, and, you know, pull over into the parking lot next door, get out. I inspect it. And it's not too bad, but it's scuffed up and it doesn't look brand new anymore. And I was annoyed and she was m more than annoyed with me um, and, uh, uh, and, and was not happy. And so we talked about it a little bit and, you know, things happen and whatever. I, you know, asked, you know, apologize, asked for forgiveness. She forgave me. Uh, but here's the thing is this car is a 2018 model. We bought it right after it came out. That, that generation came out. This is 2023. Three, right? The 5784 thing's got me losing track on the normal numbers too. Uh, but 2023, we still have not fixed the side skirt. There's still the, the gouge or not a gouge, but like the scuffs and all there. And, and you know, it's all right there. It is what it is. But uh, there, there's this constant reminder. So she's forgiven me. And that is what it is, but there's this constant reminder. So every time we walk out to the car, every time we go to get into it, you can look at the side skirt and see the damage that I so graciously granted my wife on her brand new car weeks after we bought it. Um, nonetheless, the damage is still there. We haven't got it fixed. We, we want to eventually maybe get around to it, or we'll just give it to the kids and they can drive a car that's beat up now. But uh, we, we want to get it fixed. We just haven't gotten around to it. She's forgiven me. We laugh about it now uh, sometimes. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll talk about it, kind of laugh it off and, and, and what have you. But there's still that reminder there, right? There's always going to be, until we get that thing fixed, there's always going to be a reminder of the mistake uh, uh, that I made just because I needed a cup of coffee or wanted, needs a strong word. Just because I wanted a cup of coffee uh, uh, on her brand new car, there's always this reminder there. And I don't know if you guys, you know, have ever really experienced anything like that, not necessarily with, uh, you know, jacking up a brand new car, but the reality of that mistake is still the same across the board. No matter how uh, we, we, we think about it, you know, we make mistakes, we hurt people's feelings, we do different things uh, to, to, that bother people or people do that bother us. And, and uh, sometimes even when you forgive, you try to forget about it, there, there may still always be that reminder there in front of you, right? Maybe it's something your kids did. Maybe it's something your parents did. Maybe it's something that your spouse did, like me and Danielle's car. Maybe it's something someone in the congregation or in your, your uh, local community did to you. Maybe it was some sort of crazy mistake that you made that you've forgiven yourself uh, for, but you keep having to deal with reminders constantly coming up. 
And that's the beauty of, uh, I think, this season of time that we're in right now on the Jewish calendar. One of my absolute favorite parts of Rosh Hashanah, and particularly the traditional observance of Rosh Hashanah, is uh, what we're getting ready to go down to the pier to do in just a little while, is Tashlik, the Tashlik ceremony. This is something that I grew up with as a kid in synagogue. We'd all go to the home of one of the families in the synagogue who at that time lived out on Dog River in uh, South Mobile County. We'd gather on the deck of their boathouse and, uh, and, and over, you know, stand over the river, and we'd participate in Tashlik. It's uh, always been such a beautiful picture of grace and love, of the mercy that God has given us, particularly through Messiah's blood, uh, which was poured out for our sins. And it's been a part of our observance of Rosh Hashanah uh, here at Maim Chaim pretty much since day one, uh, as long as the congregations existed. As a matter of fact, we started the congregation and uh, the, the first full year in, the High Holy Days rolled around, and that was the first thing we did on Rosh Hashanah after service was go and do Tashlik. Some of you may be new to Messianic Judaism or Judaism itself as a whole and have no clue what in the world I'm talking about when mentioning Tashlich, other than it's just another one of those funny sounding Hebrew words. So for a little context, Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of what we call the Yamim Noraim, the 10 days of awe, which are Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur. This is a season of repentance, of deep introspection and self-evaluation uh, in Judaism, a season where we're asking the Lord to draw our hearts and minds uh, t towards anything we need to repent of, anything which may be hindering our spiritual lives and walks. Uh, and we go through the process of repentance. And here's the thing with repentance in the typical believing mind, we think repentance is just simply saying, okay, God, I messed up, forgive me. And we go on about our life likely to continue to mess up in the exact same area over and over and over again. But the biblical idea of repentance is summed up in the Hebrew word teshuvah which very literally means to turn around, to return. So the imagery is if you're walking down the aisle out of the synagogue uh, because you're you know, angry for Danielle about the damage to her car, uh, you're walking out the synagogue and you realize something's wrong and you shouldn't be doing that. The Lord's turning your heart around. You physically stop dead in your tracks. You turn 180 degrees around and you walk back towards the Lord. You walk back towards his presence. Uh, you walk back towards where you are walking or running from. And so Tashlik is a ceremony held at a natural body of water uh, on Rosh Hashanah, interacting with this reality of forgiveness and repentance. We stand at the water's edge or on a pier or something of that regard that's overlooking the water. There's a bit of prayer and recitation. We spend a few moments in self-reflection, prayer, worship, and repentance. And then we cast off, which is the literal meaning of the word Tashlik, the breadcrumbs or small rocks, pebbles into the water, and then watch them be taken off by the water. This is a means of interacting with the promise found in Micah 7, 18 through 20. And there's a powerful principle I believe we are supposed to walk away from when reading the walk away with when reading this passage of scripture. And that principle is this: no sin we can ever commit is too big or too small for the blood of Messiah to wash clean and provide forgiveness. Once again, no sin that we can ever commit is too big or too small for the blood of Messiah to wash clean and provide forgiveness. So let's dig into the text a little bit today. We're going to be looking at Micah 7, verses 18 through 20. It says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, overlooking transgression, for the remnant of his heritage? He will not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will extend truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham that you swore to our, our ancestors from days of old. So a little context for you if you're not terribly familiar with biblical history and the time period that we're looking at with the, uh, the prophet uh, Micah. Uh, the, the background context of Micah is that Micah is a prophet specifically to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. This is after the kingdom splits. You have the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom that break apart. Ultimately, the northern kingdom is long-term swept away by the Assyrians, and then down the road, the southern kingdom is swept away by the Babylonians. Micah was a, pro a prophet to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. His was a contemporary uh, of guys like Isaiah and Amos and Hosea, and he was in ministry during the reigns of Jotham, uh, Ahaz, and particularly Hezekiah. 
And if you remember, Jothan and Ahaz were not even remotely able to be considered righteous kings. They led Judah astray in some pretty terrible ways. They were both very much wrapped up in idolatry, even to the point of walking their own sons through the fires of Molech, which the Torah specifically says not to do. Among all the other ways that uh, people can worship idols and such, this is something very specific that God singles out uh, above much else and says, do not walk your children across the fires of Molech, and these two kings of Judah particularly do so. But as is the case with the kings of Israel and Judah, there would be a series of kings who would be evil in the eyes of the Lord. They would lead Israel astray in all sorts of various ways. They'd lead them towards idolatry and, and idolatrous practices. Then out of nowhere, we'd have a king who would arise who was righteous and who would rule for a while and, and sort of recalibrate the nation's walk with the Lord. And this is where Hezekiah walks in. Hezekiah was the guy that righted the hearts of Israel in many ways. But Micah's prophecy as a whole was one of condemnation for Israel and Judah for Israel and Judah's many failures and for their idolatry. He speaks of judgment and destruction. He's prophesying of what would become of the Babylonian destruction at a time when the mind of Judah would be on the fact that the northern kingdom had already been invaded and carted off by the Assyrians. But as is the case with pretty much every biblical prophet that speaks judgment and condemnation toward Israel, Micah also has a powerful promise of redemption and restoration for Judah as well. He is warning that judgment and destruction will be coming, but that the Lord will not forgive his people. He will not forsake, the Lord will forgive his people. He will not forsake them. He will one day bring them back for himself, establishing them and forgiving their iniquities. In fact, if you go back and read Micah 7 in its entirety, you'll notice there are a few key pieces uh, in the flow of the text. Micah 7 verses 1 through 7 are a lament over the sins and destruction of Israel. Then we turn a corner to verse 8 through 20, and it's a series of prophetic liturgy with four components. 8 through 10 is a psalm of trust and repentance. 11 through 13 is a promise of restoration. 14 through 17 is a prayer uh, to and response from the Lord. And then verses 18 through 20 is a hymn of praise to God, a recognition of the redemption and salvation that he has promised his people. Remember, as these words are being spoken to Judah by Micah, the nation has had many years of being led astray to idolatry, followed by a very short uh, uh, patch of righteousness, which gave way to even worse sinfulness. And the cycle had continued over and over and over again ever since Solomon died, and particularly since the kingdoms split. Now, I would love to blame this on the kings and say, that this was something specific to the kings, but we also see the exact same track record in the book of Judges before the kings are established. God gives a judge like Othniel. Othniel leads Israel in peace and righteousness for 40 years. Othniel dies. Then all of a sudden they turn back to sinful ways. They turn to idolatry. They turn to the ways of the land around them. Then they cry out to the Lord because they're suffering and things are going terrible. And they, the Lord hears their, their prayer and their heart is turned away or turned around. And they, the, the Lord sends a judge in who leads them in righteousness again. And that cycle is repetitive through judges. And then it occurs all over again through the kings of Israel. The northern kingdom being destroyed should have been a wake-up call to Judah, but Judah instead continued to slide down the slippery slope like it was a carnival ride. But here's the beauty of it all. Even in the darkest times when Israel and Judah were at their worst, and God was ready to wipe us off the land and wipe us off the map, there was always a promise of redemption, of restoration, of renewal, and of forgiveness. And in Micah 7, we see one of the most amazing promises of forgiveness in all of Scripture— but it's also a powerful example of what Teshuvah, of what, to, uh, of what the idea of returning to the Lord should look like. Micah 7, 18 again says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, uh, overlooking transgression for the remnants of his heritage? He will not retain his anger forever because he delights and mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will extend truth to Jacob, mercy to Abraham that you swore to our ancestors from days of old. At the point in time that we, uh, these words were written down, the last thing that the kingdom of Judah deserved was for God to forgive their iniquities. Uh, for God to pardon their sins, for God to take joy in being merciful to his children. But listen to the heart, felt worship, and recognition of these words. The hope of forgiveness, even when it was not deserved, 
Verse 18 again, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, overlooking transgression for the remnant of his heritage? He will not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Danielle loves me, and she knew that the curb hit was an absolute accident, but I'm pretty sure she was angry when I jacked up her brand new car over just a cup of coffee. I was angry that I didn't see the stupid corner of the sidewalk at the edge of the drive through and yes, the car is inanimate, the car is just an object, the car is a practical means of transportation, I get all of that, but we were both still pretty upset about it, especially because that's, yeah, a new car is not a small investment. Granted, we bought one of the cheapest ones we could get our hands on, but it still wasn't a small investment. Obviously, I beat myself up about it uh, a, a little bit. Um, as I said before, a few things that I shouldn't have said came out if we're honest about it. Danny may have said some things in my general direction in a rather large, uh, rather loud and uh, intimidating manner. Uh, but ultimately, I apologized and she forgave me and now we kind of laugh it off, uh, or at least I think we do. Unfortunately, the dent is still there as a reminder. And see, that's the beauty of being married as you become Bosar Chad. So as long as I'm laughing, we're laughing and it's okay, right? I don't know that that's actually necessary how it's going to work, but I'm playing that one. Uh, but in the same way, when we repent, when we make teshuvah, when we return back to our Heavenly Father through the blood atonement of Yeshua, despite what we may deserve for our sins, he does in fact pardon our iniquities and overlooks our transgressions. And he will not retain his anger with us forever. Why? Because he delights in mercy. But the promise doesn't end there. Verse 19 continues on. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He will again have compassion. He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. And I love the way this is worded. He will subdue our iniquities. You understand that the only way that we can beat whatever sin we find ourselves trapped in is if the Lord subdues our iniquities. It's not just a concept of our sins being washed away. That's a big part of it. But when your sins are washed away and then you just keep diving back into that pool over and over and over again, doing the exact same thing time and time again, you have not allowed him to subdue your iniquities. You have not allowed him to rid you, to deliver you of whatever those hindrances are, whatever those addictions are, whatever they are that are holding you back from walking in the fullness of God's delight and mercy for your life because you keep cycling back around over and over and over again. Now, it's one thing if, if you walk in forgiveness and then you mess up in a different way and you have to repent of that and then you mess up down the road in a different way again, you have to repent of that. But when we continue to make the same mistake time and time and time and time and time again, at some point, thankfully God's not me. At some point, if, if that were me, I would go, you know what? I don't think you're as, uh, I don't think you mean your, your, your uh, request for forgiveness as much as you say you do. I don't think you're as apologetic as you say you are. I don't think you really mean it because you just keep doing it over and over and over again. Thankfully, I'm not God. Uh, my wife would also second that thing, uh, that I am not God. And uh, he is one who delights in mercy. And because he delights in mercy, even when we mess up in the same way over and over again, his desire is to subdue our iniquities and bring us into fullness of repentance and restoration so that he can cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Our principle, again, no sin we can ever commit is too big or too small for the blood of Messiah to wash clean and provide forgiveness. When we participate in Tashlik, we get the opportunity to interact personally with this spiritual promise in a tangible way. We have perfect faith that as believers in Messiah, our sins are forgiven and washed away. But when we get to cast the bread or the pebbles into the water and watch them vanish before our eyes, it's a powerful object lesson of the love and forgiveness that Hashem has for us. And it's for this very reason that he gave Messiah Yeshua to cleanse us of our sins. The promise of forgiveness of sin is a promise of complete removal, a washing clean, or as the KJV words it, a remission of sin. And this is, the, the, this is fulfilled in the blood atonement of Messiah Yeshua. At his final Seder with his Talmudim, as he was preparing to offer his life for ours, Yeshua declares these words in Matthew 26, 27, and 28. And he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave to them, saying, drink from it, drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the removal 
of sins. On Shavuot and Aksu, when the crowds witnessed the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit poured out upon the Talmudim and saw the manifest presence of God at work in his people, Peter preached to the crowd and he cried out, Acts 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the emissaries, fellow brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be immersed in the name of Messiah Yeshua for the removal of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as Adonai, our God, calls to himself. And again in Acts 10, when Peter is preaching to Cornelius' household, he boldly proclaims these words in Acts 10, 43. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who puts his trust in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. And John proclaims in 1 John 1, verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we, have not, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My children, I'm writing these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an intercessor with the Father, the righteous Messiah, Yeshua. He is the atonement for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. The blood atonement of Yeshua is the key to forgiveness of sin. It is the key to the fulfillment of the prophecy of Micah 7, of the promise that Micah speaks from the heart of the Lord, from his Ruach HaKodesh to the nation of Israel, particularly the southern kingdom of Judah. Repentance is the beginning of the process, but the removal of sins is vital. I often describe it like this. We have this amazing building uh, that we worship in, that we're here right now today. We most, many of us were here last night and uh, still woke up this morning, extremely tired, and showed up this morning anyways um, for, for the Lord. Um, not, you know, for any of we sacrificed our rest for the Lord um, on this day of rest. That's a weird way of wording that. But nonetheless, um, we have this amazing building, and, and as you see under my feet on the bima is this carpet, Right? And we're going to do Kiddush in a little while. And uh, if, if I were to have my cup of, of wine for Kiddush and somehow spill it on this, this carpet, it would make a stain, right? That nice purple color leaves a, a really, really nice, loud, protruding image in the, the whatever color this carpet. It's not really white. What is it? Like an off-white, tan kind of color. It would leave a nice stain here. That would be very obvious and bold, right? Right there. Stephanie wouldn't be too happy with me. No offense, Stephanie. Stephanie wouldn't be too happy with me for making that spill. But I could ask Stephanie forgiveness, and she would forgive me. And, and we'd laugh it off, and it'd be okay. Um, and see, we're not Basar Chad, so I'm hoping we would actually laugh it off, because I can't use the same joke from before. Um, but <laughs> but if, she, if she forgave me, and we continued on, and everything was good, every time we walked by that stain, though, there's a reminder to Stephanie, and there's a reminder of me of the mistake. Right? There's something there that could remind us that there was a point in time where I did something stupid, and there's still a reminder there. And even though we've gotten over it and we're laughing it off and things are okay, there's still that reminder right there. And the idea of remission of sin, of removal of sin, the idea of being uh, immersed in the, the waters for the remission of sin would be if we were to come with a steam cleaner, a carpet cleaner, and we cleaned the carpet and that stain was no more, completely gone, there was nothing left there. Now, not only has uh, Stephanie forgiven me for the idiocy of me dropping the wine as a full-grown adult on the carpet, you know, if a little kid does it, it's one thing, but if I do it, uh, but now we've gotten past the, the forgiveness and everything's okay, but now we've removed the reminder, right? When we approach the Father and ask for forgiveness, our sins are forgiven. As far as God's concerned, it never happened. It's done. It's over with. The problem is, is as long as we have reminders, and by the way, every time you try to hide your sin so nobody else knows about it, right? There's a lot of, a lot of people that have all kinds of issues, you know, whether it's addiction to pornography, drugs, alcohol, or a plethora of other things that are out there that have all sorts of issues that maybe they've overcome, maybe they've, they've found forgiveness and moved on, and the Lord has brought them uh, uh, in, in some aspect of deliverance through those things, but they're afraid to talk to other people about it. Because they don't want anybody to think worse of them because of it. They're, they're always trying to hide stuff from people. They're always trying to make sure nobody sees the nasty and the dirty of their lives. They want to put on the show so everybody sees the good of their lives, right? 
The problem with that is that the Bible specifically tells us to confess our sins one to another, not because we need somebody else's forgiveness for us to truly walk in the Lord's for forgiveness, but when we do that, other people carry our burdens with us. It's not just us carrying our burden over and over and over again by ourselves, stacking on it, because that burden isn't the sin. The Lord's already wiped that sin away when we ask for forgiveness. The burden is that the enemy loves to use that mistake against us. He loves to come in and go, "Ah, dude, I know what you did last week. I know what you did. I know what you did last summer. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't help it. I know what you did last week. How could God, it it was a slow burn across the room. I like that. Um, how How could you think God loves you? Why would God love you when you just did this, right? And God's going, look, I don't know about it. It's done. It's over with. I've forgiven you for it. You ask for forgiveness, I've forgiven you. The only thing holding you back now is, is you because you're still walking in the shame of something I've already washed clean. Remission of sin, sin is important. Re, the, the, the confessing our sins one to another is important. Now, they're, they're separate realities But they're important because they bring about the same concept and principle, which is that the enemy loves to use something God has already redeemed us from to hold us back from walking in the fullness of what God has in store for us, to hold us back from walking in the fullness of God's promise for our lives. And so if I were to spill that that wine on the floor, people might be upset at me. But once I ask for forgiveness, it's okay. Once we clean it, not only is it okay, but there's never a reminder again. And every time we walk by, it's over with. Nobody even thinks of it anymore, right? And this is the reality of remission of sin. And this is what God wants to do. This is the whole purpose to what Micah is saying here in Micah 7. It's the whole purpose to the imagery of Tashlik. When we cast the breadcrumbs or the pebbles into the water, what's interesting is when you throw the pebbles in, you watch them sink, right? They're gone. You don't see them anymore. When you throw the breadcrumbs in, they either sink, they get floated out, they get eaten by fish, the the birds come in and take them and and eat them, and and it's gone. There's no reminder. You throw in, I think we got three or four pounds of bread uh, that that we have for everybody that we're going to tear up. Everybody will have a chance to throw some in. Some of you might want big heaping handfuls. I don't know where you're at uh, in your walk, but... (laughs) My brother, when, when, when we were younger, my, we were doing Tosh Leek, and uh, my brother got a, a small handful and tossed them in, and a few minutes later went back and got another handful and tossed them in. I think he was maybe eight or nine, and he keeps doing this, and somebody goes, you know, you, you only had to do it once, and it was just symbolic. He, so he looks at them and goes, you don't know how bad I've been this year, uh, and just keeps <laughs> tossing it in. Um, but when we throw that breadcrumb or the, the pebbles or whatever it is that your, your congregation's tradition or your personal tradition is, when we throw those crumbs into the water and they get washed away, the imagery that we're interacting with, that we're participating with, uh, is the very reality of God washing our sins in the depths of the sea. And so when we throw those breadcrumbs in and they vanish, that's what your sins have done before the Lord when you ask for forgiveness and he's washed you clean in the blood of the lamb. Now the only thing holding you back is whether you want to let that go or not. Because I promise you, no matter what you've been through, no matter how bad uh, you have been, no matter how many mistakes you made, no matter how many people you've hurt or have been hurt by, I guarantee there's at least one person in this world that needs to hear your story of how God redeemed you from all of your worst because they're walking in the exact same situation. I can share my message of redemption and it will bless people. But there are certain people that my, nar- my narrative of my life isn't going to hit quite as much as maybe somebody else's. There are things that I haven't been involved with or haven't done that I can love on people and share the truth of God's redemption for, but there's something about hearing the testimony from somebody that's walked in their shoes. And the longer that we want to cleave to the sins that we've already been forgiven of as though we have something to be ashamed of, When God's already said, look, you got no shame before me and I'm the only thing that matters. If you called out on the blood of Yeshua and have asked for forgiveness of sin, I've washed it away. If you've gone through the waters of immersion, it has been washed clean off of you. There is no more reminder of that sin. If you're walking in that still, the shame of it, that's on you, not God. But there's something powerful to watching our sins fade away into the depths of the sea. There's something powerful to witnessing a symbolic reality of what God has done for us through the blood of his only son. And there's something powerful in us sharing the truth of our testimony, what God has brought us through and where God has brought us to, to other people in a way that we are not afraid or ashamed of what they may think 
but instead of what we're, we're joyous of what God can do as he delights in mercy and wants to use our message of salvation to transform others' hearts as he did with Peter and John and all the other disciples and, and many, many, many believers throughout the generations. See, when Yeshua offered his life on the, the cross, he paid the, the price to have these carpets and our hearts cleaned. Not only was I responsible for my sins and errors, not only did I make teshuvah, but my sins are washed clean by Yeshua. And, and I didn't have to pay for the carpet of my heart to be cleansed. Yeshua did. Yeshua paid the price so that we could experience not only forgiveness, but also complete removal of our sins. It's a gift freely given to all who would call upon his name. As the lyrics of the song greater than say, no guilt, no shame, no sin, no stain is greater than the great I am. No fear, no grave, no other name is greater than the great I am. Our principle one more time. No sin we can ever commit is too big or too small for the blood of Messiah to wash clean and provide forgiveness. I'd like to ask our worship team to make their way back up. Are there areas of sin in your life that you, need to, uh, that, that you need not just forgiveness but complete removal? Are there places in your life where you feel like the carpet is stained too much for cleansing? Trust that in the blood of Messiah, no stain is too, uh, too much. No sin is too terrible. No mistake is so horrendous that the blood of Messiah cannot cleanse it and wash your heart and life white as snow. He loves you. You were created in his image and likeness. And he has already paid the price for all of your sins. It's now time to make teshuvah and to trust in his forgiveness and the removal of sins. As we continue to celebrate Rosh Hashanah and as a congregation, as we are preparing for Tashlik, I want to encourage all of us to take a deep look into our hearts and ask the Lord to reveal any issues we still need to submit to him. But even more important, let us as followers of Messiah Yeshua trust in the fact that he has and will forgive and remove our sins. The cost of cleansing has already been paid on our behalf, and the balance to cover all future sins will never run dry. Let us cling to the power of these words from Micah 7, verse 18 again. Who is a God like you, pardoning uh, our iniquity, overlooking transgression for the remnant of his heritage? He will not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities, and you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And hold on to the power of the imagery Paul uses in Romans 8, verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Messiah Yeshua our Lord, our principle. No sin we can ever commit is too big or too small for the blood of Messiah to wash clean and provide forgiveness. I want to encourage you to spend the next few minutes as we worship uh, by seeking Adonai's face together as we worship. Let us search out our own hearts. Let us ask the Lord to search out our hearts and lives and find freedom from sin and Messiah Yeshua 